<laughs> nice rack. Oh, um, sorry. Yes, welcome to the workshop for a very Swedish episode today. We have before me the, uh, well, my 1815-38 infantry musket, uh, which some of you may remember from a very, very, very early beardless block and range video went, went. where I showed uh, two ways of shooting it. And um, over the years, this has got me thinking uh, as to what, what really were these capable of in a standard battlefield uh, range. So 50 meters more or less for a, you know, a really effective volley fire, for example. Um, what could these do with standard ammunition? So I'm not talking about trying to get the perfect fit down the barrel, just soldier grabbing a paper cartridge, yay, from his pouch, loading, firing, and then repeating that, uh, and seeing how well it runs and what the effect on the target would be. So that's going to be the object of the exercise. But before that, um, a bit of history on the musket itself, because I, having experienced both the Bess, Brown Bess, and the French style uh, 1777 musket, this is by far the best, I think, in terms of uh, all the percussion muskets, uh, flintlock muskets of the time, this is the one. And it came about in an interesting period in history for Sweden. Uh, when you think of arms development, you know, uh, maybe five years at the time, because the muskets, there was various patterns of, of flintlock muskets and they all had little minor improvements, but they weren't, didn't go through in entire uh, testing processes that they had in later years when you made big steps. Um, so let's say five years. So this is a the uh, the base pattern was 1815. So let's say uh, let's take 1810 then as a start off date for shaking things up. Um, it was a time when uh, the reigning dynasty in Sweden uh, was dying out. Uh, Charles XIII was on the throne. He was uh, quite elderly. He had no uh, no children. So what was going to happen next? Uh, and the Swedes had a brilliant idea of inviting Jean Bernadotte, a uh, marshal of the French Empire under Napoleon, to be their king. Now there was an interim period where he was regent and then he became uh, Karl 14th John, Charles 14th John of Sweden. And uh, the Bernadotte dynasty is still alive and kicking today, the current uh, Swedish royal family. Anyway, uh, this Jean Bernadotte, I thoroughly recommend you look up his bibliography, um, either a proper one or on even the Wikipedia one is actually quite, quite, uh, quite comprehensive. But um, he was obviously a, a marshal, so a, a man of war. But he was also a very good administrator. One, uh, as his duties, he was uh, in charge of uh, Hanover and Naples, I believe. Uh, he was quite independent. He was also not uh, afraid to uh, go against Napoleon's will, which had uh, they had a few trust issues between each other, but um, they got on grudgingly, I suppose. Uh, anyway, he was very successful. He was uh, at Austerlitz. He was at uh, Jena or Jena and the following battle at Lübeck where the Prussians were trounced again. And there were also uh, some Swedish taking part in the battle. They were taken prisoner by uh, the troops under Bernadotte and apparently were exceptionally well treated. And that was part of the decision for uh, the Swedes inviting Bernadotte to uh, be their regent and then king. And, uh, but as I said, he was a man of war, so he was experienced with uh, what makes a good infantry musket. And I think it shows in this, I mean, I'm sure he wasn't directly involved, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he had some input. Uh, so take a little closer look. So if we start at the front, and we've got a very, very big, broad brass front sight, which is uh, soldered on to the barrel. And uh, all the barrel bands are relatively thick brass, 
and very, very wide. So you've got a nice clamp of the barrel there. Uh, they're sprung, so in the French style. M middle band there. See, they've uh, went minimalistic with the sling swivels, just pivoting on a screw shoved through the stock. You can see the last barrel band there, in comparison to my hand. Again, very, very thick. And uh, I guess brass was a, probably the better choice, considering the cold, soggy climate, or freezing climate in Sweden. Again, here on the nice patina trigger guard, they've gone uh, minimalistic with the sling swivel again. It's just literally in a little notch in the casting. Uh, yeah. Minimalistic Swedish design already at work back in the day. Uh, so I think the two surprising features on here are the quality of the lock, for one. Uh, I've loosened it already. But I mean, it's, all the parts are very, very well made. They're all massive. Even the springs here, they've all been nicely relieved here uh, in the uh, U-bend. So relieving any stress there in, during the manufacturing. Same goes with the frizzen spring. One of the most ornate frizzen springs I've seen on an infantry musket. And uh, it retains a uh, dog catch, which is something typically Scandinavian. Uh, long after it had fallen out of, of uh, fashion elsewhere, uh, it seems to be very popular. Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, even in the percussion age. Uh, I guess, why not? Uh, Half-cock notches are uh, not the best of safeties. I guess back in the day when they were new, perhaps, but nowadays uh, I wouldn't trust them. And uh, it appears that neither did the Swedes, because apparently some of these, you can find them with no... Uh, half cock notch on the tumbler or sort of a half-hearted draw of the file. Uh, it didn't matter anyway because doctrine was to use the dog catch and that's you could you would engage that. So this one does have a good half cock notch it locks back just here. But anyway dog catch you just continue to pull it back and there you go. You can't get a better fit than that. And to release it you just cock the hammer. You got this surface here at the back which We'll just push it on the head of the dog and it just falls free. Now this shape, this wonderful curly shape here, apparently it was just a, a fashion thing, there was no real reason for it. You see it sometimes on uh, on English target pistols. They have this kind of uh, curled, sinuous uh, cock there. Yes, I'm going to use the word cock lots. Get used to it. Now, another feature is the pan shape. If you see there, it's curved. Normally you'd have it straight or uh, sunken. But no, this has a very relatively shallow uh, powder pan. And the curvature here matches the curvature here because the, uh, the top or rather the bottom of the frizzen here is recessed. So that means there's a lip all the way around the edges and that fits nicely inside or around the pan. If you see it from the inside, you see the pan is completely enclosed. There's even a lip at the front here, which means it's relatively uh, moisture proof. I won't say waterproof, but um, certainly give good protection against you know, rain, um, you know, splashing and anything coming more or less down on it. Couldn't prevent seepage, but then uh, you never really could. So that was a very nice attention to detail there. And I think under this light, you can also see the huge slab here. If you follow the line of my finger up there, huge slab of hardened steel that's been, I guess, soldered, welded, onto the frizzen. Uh, normally it was a tendency just to surface, to heat, to surface treat the frizzen as a whole. But here they chose just to put a big chunk in. I guess it could be eventually replaced when it wore out, but uh, I don't think I am ever going to wear this out. And it sparks very well. 
And the NT here stands for uh, Nortalia. I probably massacred that, but uh, I did my best, which is one of the uh, arsenals. They were, you also find made these made at uh, Husqvarna, because it was already in business back then. So that was the first feature. And the other feature is something that the uh, MLAIC says doesn't exist on service muskets, and that is a rear sight. Yes, smooth bore infantry muskets back in the day did or could have rear sights. Now this one is the, uh, this is why this musket is a slash 38 musket because the original pattern had the rear sight as a v-notch integral with the uh, breech tang. So there was just slightly built up a sort of bulbous bit at the back here and there was a v-notch carved in it. And um, yeah, the last modification they, they brought to it was to make it a separate part, which is dovetailed in the front surface of the breech tang. Obviously, the uh, former owner of this didn't realize it and tried to drift it, um, which is why it's a bit wobbly. Unfortunately, without debreaching it, I can't fix that. So I just make sure it's in one position when I'm shooting and, uh, and leave it there between shots. So yes, um, this rear sight is obviously a huge boost and advantage compared to the uh, using the bead on the front and maybe uh, your thumb or some point of reference. Um, the rear sight here is also a reason why they have put the uh, tang screw going up from the bottom so that you don't have a screw head interfering with the rear sight. This is something you tended to see in matchlocks and things, for example. So nice to see that still, this feature still being present. So anyway, I've blathered on about my favorite musket for long enough. Now let's blather about my other favorite subject, paper cartridges. Oh yes. Now this is a Swedish pattern uh, cartridge that I think uh, Irvin Flatness from Svartkrut for uh, doing the research on finding out what they look like and uh, how to put them together. And I'll show you that in a second. So it's got a knot before and after the ball. And uh, yeah, what you do is uh, you know, tear the end off, pour the powder in, and just shove everything in afterwards. Now this, when I'm gonna be shooting, this will be dipped in lube up to the second knot here. And, um, and then we shall see how well they do. Compared to all the other cartridges I've made, this one is an absolute cinch. So what I'm using is um, two balls, one of which is going to end up in the cartridge, and the other one is just to, to help. These are 17 and a half millimeter. The bore is, uh, well, on mine at least, is uh, 18 and a half millimeter. So this is a, without a patch, this is going to rattle down bore and come out at the muzzle in any direction it feels like it. And the mandrel I'm using is just a bit of tubing. Uh, it's 17 millimeter, and it's um, I hacked it off the end of a broom that happened to be around the house. Mrs. The chap never noticed. Anyway, what we're going to need is some paper to make the body of the cartridge. Now this I tried just as a trial and error. Here are dimensions in. Uh, Metric, you can convert it into pounds, foot per square slug, or whatever you want. And what you want to end up with is basically more or less three wraps of your paper around the ball. That seems to be the, uh, the way to do it. So that's what I've done just by uh, try and error. So firstly, you take one of them, one of the balls, put it on the end of the mandrel and roll it up. You need to leave a bit of space at the front because you're going to be tying that knot. So leave about uh, finger joints lengths in there, just about. Roll it up. Uh, 
There's a ball in there. And now I'm going to cinch it before I tie the knot. It's the easiest. So here I've got a what looks like a cheese wire, but it's a, just a bit thicker. Very convenient for this kind of thing. Just wrap it around the cartridge. Difficult to do with the camera in front of you though. And uh, roughly place it in front of the ball. Down there. Give it a tug. So that's already holding without a, uh, a knot. And I'll finish that off with what is called as an, an artificer's knot. And this is going to be even more horrible to show on camera. But let's see what I can do. This goes, whoops. This goes around. And over and then underneath and through the top two top strands. And then little cinch itself. And stay that way. Oop, and then it was dropped out. There. That's the top one. Great thing about this knot is it stays nice and tight. And uh, the excess we can trim off. Let's get a, some clippers because it's a, you've got a, a fair bit of excess paper there. There. Then take the mandrel out. The ball's in there. And then to make the second knot, you simply drop in second ball, put the mandrel in there if you like, get your uh, garroting device again, and apply second cinch. Like that. And then you do your second knot. Trim these, get these out of the way. So let's try and remember this again. Most of my scouting days were setting fire to things. So I'm afraid I missed most of the knot tying courses. Ah, come back. Lost it. I'll try that again. This makes thrilling entertainment. I'm trying to do this and keep it in the middle of the shot. So underneath and through the middle. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the delay. There you go. Put the ball out and use that for the next cartridge. There, all that remains now is to put the powder in, which I have measured. Original charge was uh, 140 odd grains. Now, bearing in mind this is finer and of higher quality than uh, the powder back in the day. This is Swiss number four, so one and a half F. Uh, I've turned, dialed it down to 120. Some of it would have been uh, used for priming. And actually one of the interesting features that I forgot, completely forgot to mention about the musket, is that the inside of the flash hole is uh, funnel shaped. So in theory, it's self-priming as some of the powder will trickle down through the uh, touch hole when you're loading and then you just need to pull the trigger. 
So, then you need to close it and what I do is I tend to just close, push to one side, fold down, and then to make it nice and pretty you fold the edges in as per period instructions, fold in the excess, more or less straight, and then you fold it forward again. And there you have it. And I said then you dip up to there with the lube. Don't get any around the powder bit. So I'm going to make a good few number of these and prepare them and then we shall go back six months and fire them. So here we are at uh, 50 meters. We have a huge target but uh, perfectly reasonable of what you'd be expected to hit in those days. And uh, nine charges, cartridges. I fired one off as a fouling charge. And uh, interestingly enough, they auto primed. So a bit of the main charge trickled through and uh, was enough to set off the main charge once uh, I pulled the trigger. So I'll try and see if that works consistently. And if not, I've got my powder flask there just to uh, top it up if necessary. So I'm going to be curious to see how well these do. Now for those sticklers for originality I'm not going to use the main ramrod uh, because although it's original it's unfortunately for a shorter musketoon therefore if I did use it I couldn't uh, load the ball all the way down so uh, unsafe. Therefore I'm going to have to use this modern equivalent. Typical once the camera's rolling.
Noticeable heat haze now. Actually, I'm amazed that it fired, including the other fouling shot, 10 shots in a row without misfiring. She's awesome. Now, let's see what happened up there. Okay, that's not bad at all. So we've got three that are already there, those two there, and that one up there. And that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So those are in a strip um, about half a foot wide over probably a foot and a half tall. So definitely a torso of man and at 50 meters that was 
perfectly adequate for the warfare at the time. And that was a relatively speedy series. Obviously, back in the day, they would be drilled to be somewhat more efficient and they would be priming before loading. So uh, once the bullet was stuffed and uh, ramrod housed, they were ready to go.